Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this inspiration session. Um, the topic for this evening is Becoming Sherlock Holmes, Solving Mysteries with Cloud Native Observability. Uh, please ask your questions uh, through the chat box and for all the public here, if you have any questions, please raise your hand after the presentation. Our representation host is Mark van der Walle. The floor is yours, Mark. Thank you, Yvonne. All right. Becoming Sherlock Holmes, solving mysteries with cloud native observability. So we're going to talk about this guy. This guy is Sherlock Holmes. He's made famous by Sir, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, right? This Benedict Cumberbatch in the form of the TV series Sherlock Holmes, right? But Sherlock Holmes was made famous by solving mysteries, nearly, let's say, magical solving skills. And he's also made famous by the phrase elementary, my dear Watson, which is very interesting because in all the books, he never says this. So he says elementary, and he says my dear Watson, but he never says the actual phrase elementary, my dear Watson. Very interesting. So this is me. And I uh, do something with software architecture and also a bit with social apps. So, and I do things with Java, cloud native development, observability. This talk is about uh, observability. And I'm a famous mystery solver. Yes, I am. Ah, perhaps not. Not even if I would wear this interesting hat. But perhaps I could be. And I will show you how you can be as well. Imagine London in the fog, and you see some well outlines of things in the distance. You can barely make out the time. And probably this is what your production environment looks like. You see some things, but many things are also hidden. So why is this important? Imagine a user. And that user uses an application. And that application uses a database. Very common scenario. Very simple. But what if things go wrong? It happens. It happens here. Or if it happens here. Or if it happens here or if it happens here. Pretty easy to spot, right? There's not much things that can go wrong in such a scenario. Well, there is many things that can go wrong, but they're relatively easy to find. But what if your environment looks like this? Hopefully it doesn't, but well, let's imagine it does. And if things go wrong, here, 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 it can go on, it can go wrong everywhere, and then boom. So it breaks down. So let's get back to London, the world of Sherlock Holmes, where he solves his mysteries, right? You can almost see the criminals in the fog, and he tries to catch them. So what would he do? Well, Sherlock would follow the evidence, follow the traces. So how can we ensure that we become Sherlock Holmes, Is that our applications our platforms need to start leaving evidence. And how can we do that? So that's where observability comes into play. And observability is not something new, but well, the concept uh, of observability, we've done that for ages, but mainly in different forms. So monitoring was something that was in place, and we usually monitor for availability. So something is up for X percent, or down for X percent, hopefully not. Um, performance, so how long does it take? Perhaps capacity, such as memory or disk, or perhaps a CPU, network, perhaps. And this is still important, but it's not enough. And so we add a few things to observability, or to the monitoring part. And then we get to the three pillars of observability. The first one being logs. We've been logging for ages, but there's a bit more to it than just what we've done for ages. Metrics. So uh, metrics is very broad, so I'll uh, go deeper in uh, on metrics for a bit later. And 
distributed tracing. So these are the three pillars of observability. And that encompasses what I'm going to talk about in the rest of this presentation. Now, let's get to logs. No, not these kind of logs, but the logs that you actually write to a file, to a, well, another system. Uh, so how, what do they look like usually? Something like this. No. The 20th, or uh, first day, October the 6th. Well, that's today, uh, 20 uh, past 7. And we're in the uh, GMT plus 2 time zone, which is very nice. The presentation started, and if you look at this, I apparently started a bit late. Okay. And this is informational, right? Uh, there's not too much going on, but okay, fine, logs. Next on, we get metrics. And the first metrics that I want to show you is a gauge. This is a gauge, fuel gauge. Uh, and you actually, a gauge is a concept that you have to measure. So it is, uh, you observe this, and that is the state of that gauge at that point. So this gauge shows that your fuel is empty. At the other point in time, it's probably full or half full, uh, but you have to observe it. That's uh, what a gauge is. That's the first one. And the second one is actually a lot simpler. Uh, you don't have to observe it, uh, usually, or you can, but it's a counter. And a counter increases. It's one, two, three, four, five. It increases over, uh, over time and it doesn't decrease. So it keeps on increasing forever. Uh, where a gauge can go up and down. So that's uh, what, you, uh, what the difference is. And the third one, as a matrix, is a timer. So you start a timer and you end the timer. And those two combined are the uh, time a timer took. Uh, and that might be a database request or something else uh, that takes a bit of time. And you get a bit of extra when you're using timers, so the amount of time events, so it looks a bit like a counter. Uh, you can use it as a counter of timed events. You get averages, so if you have a few times a uh, specific timer you, and you know the amount, you can calculate the average or a total time that it took or 95 percentile or other statistically relevant numbers. Traces. These are different kinds of traces than what we uh, use in our applications. What is a trace? So a trace can go in one application. So uh, for example, an HTTP request comes in, then it goes to part of the application, uh, and along the way, you follow along how long is it ta uh, what was going on, how long did it take, and that's all tied to one specific request. So entire chain within one application, we already call a trace. So from uh, the request received until the request is returned. And that could look, if you visualize this, something like this, and it already becomes interesting. So you have uh, uh, an HTTP call that goes into, uh, into your application. At one point, you do a database call, which is the SQL select, uh, and some other things going on. And what you can get from this is, okay, what happened? How long does it take? What was the child's uh, parent relationship? So what's, what's next in the trace? So you can follow along what happened in your application. And if you look carefully, it also goes into other applications or other type of infrastructure. And you need something for that uh, to get it to work. And that is context propagation. And if you go from one application to the other, so along HTTP request, you usually propagate that through HTTP headers. And if you use messaging, messaging systems also have headers, uh, usually. So you now have the three pillars in place. So you have logs, you have metrics, and you have traces. Uh, you, your system start leaving evidence. And then you get into this. How are you going to make sense of that? Because remember how your application landscape looked, at least. Your application landscape looks like this. So it's all over the place, right? So you have this spaghetti that you have to dive through. And so there's a few extra things that you would need to do. 
So let's dive into what you need to do. First off, is you have to aggregate all those logs, metrics, traces, all together, or at least uh, getting them somewhere that you can dive into. You know what, you, what the next problem is going to be? It's going to be this. Because there is so much data uh, coming from such a landscape that this is going to be you. You will be the guy or the girl who is being blown away with all this amount of data. So what's next? We need to solve something extra. And there's a few things that you can do. So for those who are well, in the data area or analytics area, this is probably not new. We have data, and we can actually attach metadata to that. Uh, so what kind of metadata can we add? Well, let's start with logs. It was the previous logs. And what if we can add something to that? So a bit of extra information that's useful. So we're in the douche locale. Oh, interesting. So because what presentation? There's a few presentations that actually start at the same time. So that's uh, OK. We're now in douche locale. And oh, we're about engineering with impact. So we already added a bit of extra information that's useful. Uh, that we can actually uh, filter upon. The same can be done for, for the other two um, well, pillars. Let's go into metrics. Well, usually metrics have a few tags, and they, those are attached to the gauge or to the counter or the, uh, the timer. So what kind of tag do we have? Well, would be useful to know what application it came from. Remember the huge application landscape? Um, so if it comes from the order API, OK, that's useful. Then it would be useful to know which kind of gauge it is. So imagine we are tracking memory in Java. Oh, a gauge of type heap. There is a bit more to that uh, in Java, but bear with me. So then you already know a bit more about that. Um, Metrics usually have names, so probably it's going to be um, the, the name memory uh, with the type heap, so a gauge. And the same goes for the other types of metrics. Might be useful to know which data center it came from, if you're in multiple data centers. Because if something is going on in one data center and it's not in the other, well, then you would want to know where it's coming from. Host name used to be quite relevant. Now we don't use well, physical or perhaps VMs that much anymore. So it's not as relevant uh, as it used to be, but it can be still be useful. The same goes for tracing. So again, traces. And a trace usually has a name. And what it often what you see is you see in the top, see, you see front end HTTP <coughs> get dispatch, so that's usually the name of the entire trace, probably the top part of that the tree. Uh, and uh, a trace usually has more than one, uh, well, comes from a service. There's multiple services here. You have front end, you have Redis, you have MySQL, uh, you might have back end, you might have order API, um, customer API, uh, Checkout API, for example. So you would want to know which kind of service it came from. Uh, a source service might be, so where the, the call came from, and a target service. Uh, start in an end time, it would be useful, because then you can actually create those nice bars. Uh, because well, one trace started at first, so time index zero, and a few moments later, the next one started. And at one point, it ends. A trace ID, well, you don't see it here, but it's useful to, to query upon, and, and all these things have a, a uh, similar trace ID. <coughs> a span ID, so to uh, understand, so this one bar uh, is a span, and a trace is created from multiple spans. Uh, so uh, multiple spans, one trace ID, and each span has a start and an end time. Well, parent span ID to create this tree structure, uh, so you know which span caused the next span. Uh, and span metadata, which well, depends a bit on what you want to add to it. So it could be, for example, a, a user ID or 
uh, that actually started the span. So the user ID that was logged in that triggered it, or um, again, data center could be useful if you're going cross data center with uh, your traffic. Service metadata, again, name, um, perhaps a, a team name that's, that, that handles it, so that, that supports the, uh, the service might be useful, depending on your, on your organization. Well, baggage metadata is a bit of tricky. Um, that's data that's not really belonging to a span or a trace, but that you want to constantly propagate. So remember that I talked about contact propagation. And it might be something that you want to send to another service that they can act upon it, or uh, well, that's useful for the entire trace. Depends a bit on what you want to do. So, you now have metadata. And if you have metadata, you can, well, you have a few things that you can now do extra. So let's take a look at that. First off, correlation. So we now have metadata and you can ask things like, well, give me all the uh, logs and traces with trace ID 42. It's probably still a lot of data, and you can say, okay, give me all the logs and traces with trace ID 42 coming from service X or service Y or going to service Y. So you can actually, with that metadata, you can start querying based on that metadata and then use the values that are, that are coming from that. On the other hand, metrics are probably a bit trickier. Uh, logs and metrics from application X in the last 30 minutes. Okay, uh, perhaps, hey, what happened in the last 30 minutes? Suddenly, our latency was spiking, so something slowed down. Perhaps the database was overloaded, but you need to yeah, investigate a certain time period. And then, because you don't deal with raw data usually, you need to start visualizing it. This is a visualization of uh, a specific uh, tool. Uh, it's Elastic APM. Uh, I've used it before, but there's many others. New Relic, uh, Datadog, it doesn't really matter. There's lots of open source tools as well. But you have a lot of data, and you need to visualize that to understand what's going on. Like, for example, a specific request has an average latency of uh, well, roughly four seconds, and uh, well, there's 31-ish threads or transactions per minute. Uh, you can start looking at what's important. So, or a bit of a different visualization, uh, specific trace or metrics, well, CPU usage, hey, suddenly there was a spike, and uh, memory usage also spiked, so hey, probably something was going on there. You want to investigate. And with tracing, going over all kinds of services, you can create a service map. One application going to the next and going to the next and investigating, hey, from this service to this service, it takes usually this long, um, but there is something going on. So you can start investigating uh, also from that perspective. So, and you can only do that if you have all this data with all the metadata in a way that you can query it and visualize it. So if we then move on and combine all this, you get into a observability pipeline. And for those of you who are into data, it's roughly a data pipeline, but then in a slightly uh, specialized way. So you have your different sources on the left. And well, a pipeline, it doesn't really matter what it is. It can be that you push it somewhere, it could be that you push it into a, a messaging system or a streaming system to get all the data through. So all those sources push it through there. But it could also be the other way around, that you have collectors that actually query your applications. So that really depends on the type of, uh, of data. Usually traces are pushed out and metrics are pulled out. That um, depends a bit on uh, the type of uh, application landscape. So they're actually pulling it from all those sources. And obviously then push, put it into that pipeline. It goes further along into processors. So what do the processors do? They might clean up the data, uh, start doing some correlations, um, well, transforming it into better formats or you know, depending on what, uh, what the need is. And at the end, store it in well, probably specialized stores 
for the specific type of observability uh, well, data. So logs usually are not stored in the same store as traces, depending on the system, and metrics uh, usually are in a far more specialized store than the other two. And at the end, you have services, or one service, multiple services, that query those different sources, and then you can visualize it. And I become this world-famous mystery solver. Metadata. So where do you add it? It might be that you add it at the source. So the source application adds metadata at the start. So it might be the service name, would be useful. It might be host name, IP address, depending on the need. Uh, it could also be done at the collectors, that the collectors know a bit more about, okay, collectors might be specific to a data center or depending on how the setup is. So collectors could uh, add some metadata to it. Could be at the processors. Um, that depends a bit on how that's set up. Uh, but and at the end, it can actually be also be added to at the end. And an example of that is, so I mentioned for uh, the, the team that manages a service. So for example, you, that might be a, a, an identifier in the metadata coming from the start. And at the end, you could use a team ID to query a CMDB to, hey, which team is this? Who is the contact person? Uh, because especially in the landscape that you saw, if there is a few dozen teams managing all these services, you want to know, hey, your service is causing my service problems. Could be. So you want to be able to contact them. So also at the end. So what's not in there but could be in here is alerting and machine learning. So I didn't talk about that. Uh, but usually these are into play to actually detect trends and well, if some anomaly arises or some threshold is triggered, you want to start alerting. So from the left uh, sources, it could be uh, uh, that the source is gone or hey, suddenly latency went over 25% well, higher than you wanted to. That's uh, something that you want to alert upon. I talked about evidence but I never mentioned which kind of evidence you should well, leave with your applications. And that really depends. Um, as the, the, the four golden signals from, and that Google uh, mentions in their SRE book, uh, which is uh, utilization, saturation, errors, and latency. Um, there, it really, really depends on your landscape and use cases, but not latency, so how long something takes from start till end, um, utilization, so how much CPU percentage is being used, but also if it goes constantly uh, up, up till 100, that might be that, you're, uh, that you need to scale up. Um, could also be business metrics, so for example, number of checkouts uh, that are happening. If there was, they were going steadily and suddenly, boom, checkouts go to, well, let's say, 5% of what it was before, you probably be, want to start measuring that and alert on that. And r what you really, really would want to know is how your user perceives it, but that's, the, well, that's really, really, really hard to get into place. Uh, but then you, yeah, well, perceives it and not what they actually see, but uh, what their browser experiences. That would be uh, the best that we can do for now. So, solving mysteries with cloud-native observability and as you might have noticed, I didn't really touch upon the cloud native. And what cloud native for me with observability is, it's not just a buzzword, it's not just something like you have cake and wedding cake and then you can just make it well, 10 times more expensive. Well, it's actually how marketing works, but just toss cloud native in there. But what cloud native observability for me is, it is part of the platform. You as an application developer just needs to well, plug it in, and it starts gathering, processing all that data. So it's part of the platform. Uh, if it's on the cloud or on-premise, it would be nice if your team, your functional team, your DevOps team, has this as a well, observability as a service. And that's what cloud-native observability is for me. So you have this all in place, and now 
when things go wrong, this is you saying to your friend, Mr. Watson, elementary, my dear Watson, this is where the problem is. So thank you for your attention. And if there is any question, please ask them or uh, well, find me uh, afterwards. Any questions from the chat? Yeah, hi, Mark. Uh, there are no questions yet okay. through the chat, so... Yeah. Well, perhaps they come. Uh, Do you have some examples for cloud-native tools today? Okay. Uh, I'll repeat the question. Uh, the question was, are there any examples of tools that can do this? Well, uh, most cloud providers have this in place. Um, there is also something that you can do on-premise with, oh, uh, I showed Elastic uh, APM. Um, for that, uh, for several languages, well, Java is the one I know most, you can just add an agent and it gathers well, tons of data, uh, even more that you, than you want. Um, and that already starts uh, making things well, uh, very easy. So that's instrumentation of your, your code with an agent, uh, with Elastic APM. Uh, they can also do that in your browser uh, if you want to. So with uh, real user uh, monitoring, then start sending data. Um, for metrics, you can also use that, but there is also uh, things like Prometheus, uh, logs, there's many systems in place. Um, so there's so many systems in place, Datadog, Dynatrace, New Relic, um, that, that are actually SaaS solutions. Uh, On-premise, there's a lot in place. Um, yeah. Uh, many choices to be made, and hopefully your well, platform team uh, has something in place uh, to do that for you. Some other questions? Oh, Please over there. Minute, yeah, you can uh, you get the microphone. Um, which uh, of, uh, you have experience with uh, a couple of tools? Uh, yep. Which of the tools were the easiest to, uh, to implement? Um, well, what you now get is uh, there is this, well, would say movement, but that's not really the right words, but you have the uh, open, open telemetry standards, and usually when it gets to standards, then it's really hard that, uh, well, there is this famous, well, famous, uh, there's this comic, hey, there's 10 standards, that's ridiculous. Let's create a standard that fixes all these standards. There are now 11 standards. So usually that's the case. There's an, but with open telemetry, you now see that all the vendors are at least moving to that. Uh, so something that supports open telemetry would usually work. For metrics, I'm a very big fan of Prometheus. Um, there is so much support for that in, well, most ecosystems, uh, I've also seen it in, in Kubernetes, but also on Azure, AWS, uh, to, well, the ability to ingest those kind of metrics. Logs are already, well, uh, Splunk and Elastic are very good in that. Um, and with distributed tracing, that's, I think, the, well, the latest kit on the observability block. Um, it really depends on, on your, your application landscape, what's already there. So if you have Elastic, yeah, start using Elastic APM because that is well, integrates seamlessly, almost seamlessly. So it really depends on your application landscape, on your programming languages, uh, are you on-premise, are you in the cloud, which cloud, all kinds of things like that. Other questions? All right. Then I thank you for your attention, and if you uh, think of something afterwards, uh, I'll be around for a bit.